Hey mushroom nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I have a lot of mushrooms here that I've found. Uh, it is the first nice day after the equinox in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, but I have a lot of different species, both delicious and deadly to share with you today. Uh, starting with this most ridiculous chonky mushroom. This is Amanita ropalopus. I found it with uh, its skirt around its cankles. So this mushroom is, uh, you know, most likely toxic. It smells terrible. So it smells very strongly of chlorine. It has this sort of warty cap and the warts, if you mess with them, they'll start to flake off. And this sort of, you know, uh, creamy undersurface. And, uh, you know, the, the gills are unlike uh, some Amanita mushrooms. So it's a genus that has a lot of different species. I'm gonna show you several of them that have really white gills. But uh, Amanita ropalopus has these sort of creamy colored gills, this monstrously big uh, sort of floofy stem. Ew, and t this one has goo at the bottom, which is unsurprising. Uh, but it also has this big chunky, you know, cankle base, basically. So you have uh, these like recurved uh, bits of flesh that are pulling back from it. It's starting to uh, stain sort of a little reddish brown. And it's this big old like lump. And so, uh, you know, this is an interesting distinction for a large group of mushrooms that oftentimes smell really bad and are in the Amanita genus and warty is that they have these big uh, bulbous bases and uh, they are uh, often, you know, Amanita section Lepidella. There's also Amanita section Roanokensis. There's some taxonomy stuff going on, but the long and short is Amanita ropalopus is, um, you know, when it's mature, one of the largest mushrooms that you'll find in the North Carolina Piedmont. And again, it and uh, its relatives uh, oftentimes have these really pungent aromas. So, you know, I uh, am very, very pleased to have a chance to handle this thing. But nonetheless, I also want to wash my hands almost immediately. So Amanita ropalopus, when it's big, has, a, you know, it's very clearly like a big cap and stem mushroom. But when it is young, it has also another interesting growth form. So essentially you have this giant bulbous base, and that's really the distinctive feature for or uh, Amanita section lepidella is this big bulbous base as opposed to like a cup or, uh, you know, there's a couple of different forms that Amanita bases can take. But uh, when Amanita ropalopus is a baby, it still smells very strongly of chlorine and uh, has this warty cap, but it's just a little, you know, nubbin. And so this really gets a honk and huge, but the base actually remains essentially the same. It'll kind of expand down and start to see, you'll see those like recurved uh, bits of flesh that start to split off at the top. But anyway, it's always fun to find, you know, a little family of these because it's like these gross little chest pieces. And then you have, I don't know if this uh, is properly a queen, maybe a bishop. But anyway, you have these really, you know, ridiculous, smelly, giant Amanita ropalopus mushrooms. And I just had to start there because I couldn't sit with a mushroom in my view without picking it, uh, especially when it's that size. And when I mentioned the skirt of Amanita ropalopus, I want to show you what is left of it. So when I arrived on the scene here, the skirt of this mushroom was lying, uh, again, around its fat and tubby base. And so uh, the skirt itself is very, very delicate. And on one side, it's got these nice vertical lines. And then on the other side, it's all kinds of floofy and, uh, you know, I think flocculose is the word. So, you know, it's very, very crumbly. And uh, so, you know, Amanita ropalopus, if you find it in perfect condition, it will have a big ring on the stem, but very frequently it either falls off or you have tangles and tears of it. Sometimes also it will uh, stick to the, like the ring of the, or the uh, perimeter of the cap. You'll get these big shaggy pieces of uh, veil material. So that's Amanita ropalopus presumed to be toxic. Certainly wouldn't be something that would be appetizing uh, under any circumstances. Now I'm gonna move on to a wide variety of other mushrooms. I will start with the edibles. Um, so I want to show you one of my favorite, it may in fact be my favorite edible mushroom. So these are uh, hidden mushrooms. So the common name for this is a hedgehog mushroom. And uh, this is Hiddenum subgenus alba. Ooh, getting a good bit of sunlight, but nonetheless, I think you can still see it okay. So these mushrooms have little teeth underneath. Uh, and you know, you have a lot of mushrooms that grow on the forest floor that they have gills underneath or they have even, you know, wrinkles 
pickles or uh, pores. But in the case of uh, your hedgehog mushrooms in the hidden genus, you have, you know, again, these little uh, teeth that are really uh, kind of, you know, spiky. They can come off very easily and brush off. In addition, for, uh, you know, the uh, hedgehog mushrooms, you have a uh, typically sort of a white and creamy colored uh, fruiting body. They can get larger than this, but sometimes, especially like right now, the weather is very, very dry. So I wouldn't expect these mushrooms to get much larger than they currently are. But, you know, they're normally this sort of very pleasing white to creamy color, at least the ones that grow uh, local to me and many of the ones on the eastern, uh, you know, in the eastern U.S. And a lot of the species of hidden mushrooms uh, also have a staining reaction so they uh, have a really dark sort of rusty orange stain. Uh, sometimes it's more bright, but here I'll show you another one that I have sliced and you can see, uh, you know, this nice sort of ice cream, you know, vanilla ice cream color. And then you have this orangey color coming in. And if you look really close on this one here, let's see if I can get a good focus point. The, uh, it's very hard to see, but the, the teeth are quite small. So they're really, at the you know, this one is a baby. Unfortunately, I killed him. But, you know, they're little bumps as opposed to teeth. So as they mature, they turn more toothy. Here's one that is a little bit more so. So if you see, uh, you know, the undersurface of a mushroom and that's what you've got, more than likely you have uh, a hedgehog mushroom. There are lookalikes. So what you have um, in particular are the hidden alum genus. And so they have some similarities. You don't typically have this nice fleshy, uh, you know, um, sort of fruiting body. Instead, it tends to be more woody or corky, sometimes uh, furry. You also have the Sarcodon genus, and uh, those mushrooms can be also on the forest floor, and they have a sort of um, feathery looked, uh, look on top of them. So they tend to be like a grayish, brownish color with this feathering uh, appearance. So these little uh, splits and, and feathers that come off of the top that are uh, black typically are very, very dark brown. So you have this variegated uh, sort of color and feathery appearance on the top of Sarcodon mushrooms. And uh, many of those are bitter. Uh, you know, I guess there's um, a lot of them in the uh, in the Rocky Mountains are actually quite delicious. But when I find sarcodon mushrooms, I found one last weekend or a pair of them that was uh, a nondescript kind of vaguely, uh, you know, it was brittle and watery uh, instead of bitter. But typically, sarcodon mushrooms they're harmless, but they aren't palatable. So, uh, you know, back to our hidden mushrooms, they uh, have this, you know, really nice coloration. This I would call hidden subgenus alba, and I'm not going to go any further than that as far as the scientific naming is concerned. There are 16 to 17 distinct, um, you know, different species of hidden that are in the eastern U.S. And so, you know, this time of year, like um, late summer and early fall, I see hiddenum subgenus alba. So those are uh, really white on the scale of creaminess. So you have some hedgehog mushrooms that are much darker and, uh, you know, like a, it's still a creamy color, but it's like a much darker creamy color. But hiddenum subgenus alba is very white. And also most of them that I encounter have that orange staining reaction. Now it can be really fast and really orange. It can be slower and sort of a brownish orange, but nonetheless, that's what I'm looking at. Uh, and I would also call, you know, hedgehog mushrooms, like if you're just getting started with foraging, one of the sort of like top two or three things you should learn because they're easy to identify. They come back in the same place year after year. Uh, they grow in chanterelle patches, which is convenient because they aren't as numerous as chanterelles. So they're a treat to find, but you'll find them in your, you know, your chanterelle spots. And they have this really nice, like nutty flavor and they impart a lot of flavor, good texture. I am a huge um, proponent of eating hedgehog mushrooms. So uh, that's my favorite edible. I keep coming back like year after year. There are a lot of different more like exotic flavored mushrooms, but uh, hedgehog mushrooms just always please and delight me. I love finding them. I love finding them when their teeth are nice and clean so I can get them, you know, in perfect condition. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to share them with you. All right, so let's move on to another edible mushroom that is also really some beautiful specimens of it. This is, whoop, 
this is a mushroom I'm going to try not to drop. So this is Amanita jacksonii, and this is Amanita jacksonii in the strict sense. And when I say that, I will explain in a second what I mean. So um, essentially, we have a mushroom that is in the Amanita genus, similar to this giant Amanita ropalopus. But as you can tell, we're looking at very different critters here. So uh, Amanita jacksonii is part of a group of mushrooms or a section of species called Amanita section caesariae. So in general, you can call these uh, Amanitas that are sort of bright orange and reddish colors with, uh, you know, this big white cup at the base. Amanita section caesariae is the direction you want to look when you're identifying them. Amanita jacksonii is probably the best known of these as far as like Eastern U.S. Uh, edible Amanita mushrooms in section Caesarea. That's a long statement, but they are probably one of the most iconic edible mushrooms in our area. So uh, what you have is a cap and stem mushroom, and it has like its most distinctive feature of all is this uh, cup of tissue at the base. And if I uh, pull it off, it's really leathery. It's almost like, oh, I'm having a hard time with it. Uh, so, and actually this is a good example of how distinct this cup of tissue is compared to uh, the stem. And so like it really is at the base, this, uh, you know, very distinctive, almost leathery white cup of tissue. And sometimes when I'm messing around with them, I'm like, ooh, they're like dinosaur eggs because they have this sort of pleasing uh, leathery surface as they mature. So that's at the base of the stem. The stem for Amanita jacksonii is going to be yellow, but what you have is an overlay of sort of this reddish, um, like sort of poppy red, vermilion to orange, uh, you know, material that gives you a sort of, in this case, it's, it's just a little bit of additional coloration on top of a yellow stem. But in uh, other instances, let's see which one of you has the best example of our chevrons. This is probably the best example. Okay, so you have this, uh, you know, yellow stem, but this sort of orangey material, which matches the orangey material underneath here. I'll get to that in a second. And it starts to form uh, these sort of like uh, chevrons or a patterned uh, sort of splitting action going on. So you have this orangish to reddish overlay on a yellowish stem. Uh, you also have a uh, red cap, and these are, you know, the younger versions of them. And so, you know, they are uh, red to orange. You oftentimes have variation throughout. Uh, so like darker red on the top, and then they uh, sort of are, um, more uh, yellowy and orange as you get to the margin. They are also striate, so that means they have little stripy grooves that you can see around the edge of the cap. This is a great example of a mature specimen because it has, uh, you know, a really nice cup at the base. It's been eaten a little bit, so the chevrons aren't as intact as I would like, uh, but it also has a beautiful example of the um, the annulus or the skirt that is on the stem of Amanita jacksonii. So it's really uh, nice and thick. It's a little bit on the soft side. It's also matching in color to this orange overlay. So you have like yellowy gills, orangey and very uh, almost uniform uh, and when I say uniform, it just sort of like comes out and then comes straight down. It has a couple of nice little, uh, you know, folds and curves. But sometimes these Amanita like uh, rings are really chaotic and all over the place. And this one's very, you know, it's very neat as oh, there's a good example. Very neat. She's she's going to do a curtsy for us. And uh, and then, you know, this this variation as well. in um, you know, the the cap is really quite nice along with the striation. So uh, Amanita jacksonii is edible. I like it when it's uh, young. Um, here's another good example of it that is uh, a little bit older. So as you can see, it isn't necessarily this bright, you know, vermilion red. It can definitely turn more on the orange side. And the main thing that makes this Amanita jacksonii as opposed to one of the other uh, Caesar Amanitas in that same uh, species section is the uh, the orange chevrons. So if you see that material on the stem, that's really the direction you want to go. But uh, and you know the nice thing about these cups at the base of the stem is you just can't miss them. Like if you pick the mushroom, if you don't get the cup, you're going to see a little cup like sticking up and staring at you, saying, "Hey, you didn't collect the whole fruiting body." It's not always easy, and you know certainly when it comes to mushroom identification, it's important to get the like 
cap and stem and certainly anything that's at the base. And so, you know, these uh, cups of tissue, it's called a vulva, is a really important feature for identifying also deadly poisonous mushrooms. I'm going to take a sip, of, <laughs> a sip of water, which I desperately need, and then I will talk about that. All right, here we go. Also, I think the fellow over there is about to um, turn on his chainsaw, and there is nothing I can do about that. So my apologies. The only other thing that I'll say is if you like this mushroom t-shirt and you want to support the channel, I do have um, a store where I sell some of my original artwork on t-shirts. It's mushroomana.com. Uh, so, you know, if you want to support me and support the channel, feel free to do that. No pressure whatsoever. All right, so let's talk about deadly mushrooms that have uh, vulvas or cups at the base of the stem. So this is a destroying angel mushroom of some species. I'm not sure. I have to do, like, I have a few different uh, collections of destroying angels with me that I'm going to show you, but I want to take them home and mess around with them a little bit and see uh, if I have different species represented here, because they do look a little different, but that doesn't necessarily mean much, so I need to dig in a little bit. That said, these are all uh, Amanitas in uh, section Phylloidea. So we have Amanita section Caesarea. So these are the bright, uh, you know, typically red and orange and uh, sometimes more on the yellowy and um, like amber colored. But then you have Amanita section Phylloidea, which is, uh, you know, I think that the type species is Amanita phylloides, known as the death cap mushroom. And that mushroom is not like pure white like this one, but it does have this, uh, you know, cup at the base of the stem that's very distinctive. And phylloidea is, you know, chock full of mushrooms that will shut down your liver and do all kinds of terrible things to you. So not to be eaten or trifled with. So Amanita phylloides, we do see it here from time to time in the North Carolina Piedmont, but far more often we see uh, different kinds of destroying angel species. And so they look in a lot of ways is similar to their, uh, you know, genus mates, this uh, Amanita jacksonii. You have a cup at the base of the stem, that vulva. You have a cap and stem mushroom. Uh, but then you start to see a lot of difference in the fruiting body. So uh, first of all, with um, the different destroying angels, the mushrooms are white. And, uh, you know, the variation in degree of white is one of the reasons I want to take this particular mushroom home because this is a destroying angel that may be uh, either uh, Amanita elliptosperma, 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 or Amanita magnivolaris. And so these are um, destroying angel mushrooms that are like just as deadly, just as poisonous, but um, aren't always as bright white as the collections of uh, others that I have here, which I would call almost certainly Amanita bisporigera. So anyway, this mushroom is also a destroying angel. The thing that's peculiar about it is that it isn't as bright white, uh, but it still has this uh, cup of tissue at the base. It has a big ring on the stem, which you will see with the other specimens that I have. And uh, I collected, this is not the best um, specimen of it, but I, I collected one that is really quite large earlier this season. And, um, you know, as best as I can tell with help from some experts, it's Amanita magnivolaris. Uh, Amanita ellipsosperma is also, you know, known to be present in this part of the, the country or the world. And, uh, you know, the one thing I guess I will mention about this while I'm tangenting on this unusual uh, destroying angel is that you have a, basically a pointy, uh, you know, uh, a, a pointy vulva, essentially, at the base of the stem. And the reason that that is, you know, kind of uh, an interesting or distinctive feature is that, um, you know, your classic destroying angel for the Eastern US is Amanita bisporigera. And you can see it also has a cup of tissue at the base, but it is very, uh, very round and nice and, you know, it's got a nice round bum. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's not as neat or tidy, certainly, as what you have at the base of Amanita jacksonii. It's much more, uh, you know, like fused to the mushroom and a little uh, less, you know, tidy, I guess is the best way to describe it. But it is very much distinctive tissue that you can pull, you know, separate from the base. What you also have, again, is a white mushroom. It has um, white gills underneath. Ooh, this one still has its partial veil. Let's fix this. 
All right, I'll show you one that has its uh, white veil uh, evidence. So basically what you have is, um, a, it's called a partial veil. So this is tissue that protects the mushroom's gills when it's little. And then uh, as the mushroom blows up in size, then it will break and usually leaves a ring on the stem, but it also leaves things like bits that are on the gills still or around, sometimes you'll see it around the margin of the cap. And that's how you can end up with something where it's like you have uh, tissue that matches on the margin and then also a ring on the stem. So, but in the case of uh, most of these destroying angel species, you have, oh, here's a pretty good example, a, uh, a ring on the stem and a all around white mushroom, you know, white stem, white cap. Sometimes it's a little bit, um, you know, slightly tacky and a little bit, um, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, <laughs> a little bit on the shiny side, but you know, overall these are mushrooms that are, uh, you know, fairly distinctive. You definitely want to be cautious with overall white mushrooms uh, as a result, because if you eat a destroying angel, it would not go well for you. I'm not going to go into the chemistry of that, but suffice it to say, you know, you can find them all over the place and, and they do take kind of different um, appearances. So this is one of the reasons I want to take my collections home and see if I have different uh, destroying angels, you know, represented here, because there are numerous species, at least four, uh, that you could call destroying angels in the, uh, you know, Eastern US. And so, you know, they can be tall and skinny. This is a really good example also of a mushroom that you have to be, um, you know, conscious of um, the egg form of Amanita. So you've seen all of these different cups at the bases of stems, and that is the result of the mushroom coming up in that little protective cup of tissue and then bursting out of it. So this youngin right here is probably a good example. And it has, oh man, it has got a nice little pointy butt as well. So we're gonna, we're gonna have some fun uh, messing around with my Amanita books and hopefully being maybe corrected by people on social media with my various hypotheses of what we've got here. But uh, so if you uh, open this up though, you can see that like the, you almost have like a little egg and the thing to be aware of if you are collecting edible puffball mushrooms is uh, occasionally these, you know, immature amanitas can look like a puffball when the uh, mushroom hasn't emerged yet. So you want to make sure that if you have a puffball, slice it, slice it open. This one is obviously pretty mature as far as the amanita is concerned. But even when they're little, you'll see this little arc of uh, fertile tissue, and that's what's going to become the cap and the gills there. And so, you know, if you're collecting puffballs, you want something that is a white little ball that is uniform all the way through white tissue. Okay, another sip of water. And we're going to talk about uh, oyster mushrooms, I think. Um, I think that's probably the next place we should go. All right, so it is now officially fall. Uh, Equinox was a couple of days ago. And so we're starting to see uh, more and more pleuratus mushrooms. So this is um, probably pleuratus ostriatus. So we have a number of different oyster mushrooms. They are edible um, and they are decomposers that grow on wood. These oyster mushrooms are a little bit, um, you know, if you are a beginner, you could find them to be a little bit irritating uh, because, you know, oyster mushrooms, they grow off of, uh, you know, they decompose wood and they, they can be living trees as well. Like they can be very parasitic. But uh, from the top, you have these nice sort of scalloped looking mushrooms and you flip them over and you also have these, uh, you know, nice deep gills that run down the stem a little bit. And the, uh, you know, the surface is nice and, and smooth. And as you, uh, you know, if you open up the fruiting body, you have uh, sort of nice, thick, meaty um, flesh. And so this is a pretty, uh, you know, popular edible mushroom. The thing that could be irritating about this specific specimen for a beginner is that many oyster mushrooms don't have much of a stem it, and if they do have a stem it is kind of off center and it's more of like a lump or a bump that is like the a bit of fungus that uh, the mycelium used to just push the fruiting body out through the surface of the wood that it's growing from but um, you know this oyster mushroom decided he was going to go above and beyond and grow a pretty significant stem so really uh, you know you just want to be mindful that oyster mushrooms are pretty indeterminate and you can definitely have 
have ones that are stemmed that are still, you know, pleuratus ostriatus and very, very similar uh, delicious ones. So uh, again, identification wise, this is a fairly easy mushroom to go about identifying besides growing on wood and having this scalloped appearance and sort of, you know, colors from a, um, you know, tan color through to this uh, sort of almost creamy turning to gray uh, color. They also have a really distinctive, what I would call oyster mushroom aroma. That's not very helpful, I know. The best thing to do, if you want to truly know what I mean, is go to the store and purchase some oyster mushrooms. They're very commonly available uh, and open it up and you get this like, it's, I mean, some people describe it as seafood. I don't think it's seafood. It's not meaty either particularly, but it's more meaty than it is fruity. So it's, it's more mushroomy than it is meaty and more fruity than it, it is, you know, in the triangulation of these things, it smells like an oyster mushroom. And that, again, it's not terribly helpful, but it does have a pretty distinctive aroma that is also not very faint. Like you don't have to really put your nose on it to get this uh, smell off of the mushrooms. And again, really, really deep blade-like gills. They're nice and soft and uh, decurrent, meaning running down the stem. So you wanna be mindful. You do have mushrooms that are lookalikes that can be uh, you know, problematic. I also have a really dried out example of uh, Pleuratus levis. So this is an oyster mushroom. Like when I first saw these, actually, I didn't see the top of them at first. I saw just their, their shape, with the, with the stems, and so I thought, oh, it's probably Pleuratus levis, because Pleuratus levis is a um, type of oyster mushroom that typically does have, you know, a significant stem, and, uh, you know, by way of comparison with other species. The thing about Pleuratus levis, and again, this, this specimen is like rock hard, they are not often eaten because they are uh, tough and hard as they mature, and they oftentimes have a lot of, uh, like, felty and woolly material at the base of the stem, or sometimes actually this whole stem is, is woolly. So it's, it's really like, even when they're young, they can be very, very dense and woolly and sock-like, and I'm just not into it. However, you know, that's the thing that, you know, really I had to inspect these a little more closely because if I had just looked at them, I would have thought, oh, you know, because they have these large, uh, tall stems that's also sort of centrally located, it's more likely uh, Pleuratus levis. But as I approach, it's like, oh no, this is uh, just a classic oyster mushroom that just went a little bit above and beyond uh, when it decided to grow. All right, so let us do a really quick chit chat about chanterelles. We're getting to the end of the chanterelle season, uh, but I will continue hoping to see them through mid-October, kind of depending on the weather. Um, so I'm not going to go through a lot on chanterelles, but they are, you know, a delicious edible mushroom when you're talking about these. Oh, and, and this is a good example, a good opportunity to show actually the color differential here between our little hedgehog mushrooms that I love so much and our chanterelle mushrooms. So they grow in the same spots, but, um, hedgehogs oftentimes to me, when I find them, you spot them and they're next to a chanterelle and you're like, oh, that's a, a you know, a chanterelle that didn't get enough sunlight. Oh, poor it. It's, you know, kind of bleached out. And then when you get close to it, sometimes you'll see a little bit of, you know, this orange stain is what I see. And I'm like, Ooh, I've got hedgehogs instead. But anyway, uh, you know, your chanterelles, they're kind of, um, a nice, you know, flowery looking mushroom. These are relatively small ones. They can get much larger, but again, we've had pretty uh, dry conditions. And what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, they often are conjoined at the base. So you can have uh, twins or triplets. There's one species that grows around here that I see like five, six fruiting bodies all jammed together at the base. And, you know, I mention this because uh, one of the things that's important with chanterelle identification is to make sure that you are not accidentally picking jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, which is Omphalatus alludens. Omphalatus alludens looks very different from a chanterelle in a lot of respects, but if you're out after these mushrooms in the fall, you will probably see the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, and it is a sort of pumpkin-y orange color. It has uh, gills that run down the stem, so the, you know, sort of classic chanterelle um, identification features are uh, wrinkly false gills that run down the stem and an orangey color. 
And then Ompelatus alludens also uh, clusters at the base and it grows, uh, you know, uh, typically out of uh, wood or at the base of trees, whereas chanterelles grow from the ground. But I mentioned this, you know, twins and triplets and sometimes big handfuls of chanterelles because uh, that clustering behavior has, I've seen a couple of people get confused by it and say, oh, this is, you know, it is clustering, therefore it has to be on Philodus alludens. And it's like, no, 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 no. We have to back up and look at the totality of things. And also when we're talking about chanterelle clusters versus on Philodus clusters, you have a pretty different behavior. So on Philodus, like you can have a dozen, two dozen mushrooms from one very small central base. And so you kind of pop it up and you have just this big blue of mushrooms, big bouquet in your hands. Whereas, uh, you know, the chanterelles, they're much more like, oh, we decided we're just going to push up together. And we're, you know, can even, again, in small clusters, you still don't have a singular base, uh, you know, a singular stem base. They're just conjoined stem bases. All right, moving onward. I would encourage you to, um, learn to identify chanterelles if you don't know how. They're very, very easy. And, uh, you know, if, if you're just interested in like basic mushroom hunting in, uh, you know, the North Carolina Piedmont and a lot of similar habitats in the Eastern US, learn how to identify chanterelle mushrooms and hedgehog mushrooms. Learn how to recognize these, uh, you know, poisonous destroying angel mushrooms. Avoid ones that smell like a peed in pool or a ham sandwich. And, uh, you know, you can go about your day and observe a lot of other species and kind of feed yourself and keep yourself safe uh, in very, very general terms. There are obviously lots of other things that I would recommend. All right, so um, nextly, let's see actually if I can, now that our light is a little bit less obnoxious, see if I can get a closer view of these teeth. I am not very good at this but I'm practicing on you. Um, okay. It's not great. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to do some practice on this, but I was trying to show you a little more closely the, uh, the teeth on the surface of these hidden in mushrooms, but I'm just doing a God awful job at this point, but suffice it to say, they have these adorable little teeth underneath and it's really, uh, you know, makes them sometimes almost look like sandpapery when they're really, really immature. All righty, let's talk about um, Lactarius indigo group, because why not? This is one of my favorite mushrooms. It is a bright blue sucker. Uh, well, it's actually more of a silvery blue when it's, uh, you know, you're inspecting the top of it. When it's mature, it usually has this big divot in the middle. Nice concentric growth zones. Check that out. So there are these like little bands of uh, wobbly color. Really, really love it. Also, as they mature, you get um, green uh, staining that starts to come in, and that's really attractive. But the thing that makes Lactarius indigo group so much fun is that it bleeds blue juice when you damage it. And so that's super enjoyable every time I get out and about. There are several different species of this sucker, and I think that there's probably a big difference in how much juice they produce. But the genus Lactarius is uh, characterized by mushrooms that are milky, and they bleed latex when you damage them. But Lactarius indigo is like all kinds of blue juice everywhere. This is an edible but that I don't typically bother with just because it's kind of brittle and a pain in the butt and I'm not a very good cook. Um, all right, next let's talk about um, Suillus hertelis. So um, Suillus is a genus of spongy bottomed mushrooms. So we have a lot of mushrooms that you would call a bolete type mushroom. Here's um, a Tylopilus, I believe. So uh, basically underneath, instead of gills or something, you have um, a spongy layer. So that's where uh, the spores come from. Sometimes that spongy layer is way thicker. But we have a genus that's called Suillus. And Suillus is, uh, you know, a fun genus for a lot of reasons. But the main thing that, you know, a lot of them are really like goopy and slimy and, uh, you know, typically edible. Uh, I say really they're not remarkable, but if you are a diehard mycophile, you will always eat your Bruce Willis. All right. 
I'm going to move onward. The thing that makes uh, Sewellus mushrooms, you know, distinct from other genera of bolete type mushrooms, so the ones with the spongy underbottom, is that they have what are called glandular dots. So basically these are these little smudges or dots of material on the stem itself. And so you have uh, Lexinum, which is another genus that has more like scabers, so they're more uh, like horizontal and a little bit more flaky and, uh, you know, well, they're scabers is how they're described. Whereas Sewillus, it really is, you know, again, these dots that sometimes are, you know, a little bit harder to observe. Like these are nice and mature uh, specimens. And so like you have a white or a, excuse me, a yellow stem with sort of a cinnamon colored, uh, you know, dot pattern uh, on, on the uh, stem. And uh, I would call this Sewillus hertellus in particular. So you have, uh, you know, sort of an orangey but more yellowy uh, undersurface. And, uh, you know, again, it's spongy. It does not stain. And you can see here, it's not very deep, but, you know, it's, it's just these little, uh, you know, spongy tubes underneath. On top, you have a mushroom that's kind of yellowish, and then it gets little, uh, you know, reddish stains or streaks sometimes looks like scabers <laughs> and so sometimes looks like little fibery bits that are uh clinging to the top you can see that a little bit the light is terrible my bad on that uh but you know you, you, it's uh sometimes sort of an orangey color like you get this um streakiness or they look like fibers but they're not it's just basically uh you know color attached to it here's a younger one that really was uh, freaking me out a little bit because it is orangey underneath and I can't even get a good image of it. Oh, here we go. So it's got these little bits of uh, sort of orangey droplets of, uh, you know, liquid on it. And I mentioned that just because there is a Suillus called Suillus sub aureus that has uh, an orangey undersurface and also sometimes has those uh, orangey dots or yeah, like uh, the orangey um, uh, liquid, but then uh, has reddish staining at the base. And again, the light is just so bad, but um, you can see here, there's a bit of red stain, especially at the base. I think I have another one over here that showed, oh yeah, here we go. So uh, I cut this one a few minutes ago and aha, there we go. Okay, so that's what I would prefer to see. Um, I really set up in the wrong spot here just because of my giant Amanita ropa lopus. But you can see, you got this reddish stain. I am almost certain this is Suillus hertellus. You know, Suillus sub aureus is more documented further up north. And also I found these growing with um, loblolly pine and Suillus hertellus in particular is uh, known to be preferential to loblolly pine. So that is more than likely what it is. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about our Cortinarius. I'm getting close to the end here, at the very least. I, I'm getting close to the uh, end of my ability to, to talk aloud. God, it's a gorgeous day outside. All right, thanks for spending time with me. I'm feeling a little spontaneous today just because the weather has changed and so I'm less purpose-driven. Like during the summertime, I'm out mushroom hunting the second it's light enough to be outside. And because of that, then you also have the diurnal creatures uh, that are really active at that time. So copperheads who are very hard to see to begin with are more active during that period. And so I'm like, okay, I have until like 10, 10.30 a.m. maximum. And then it's gonna be 90 degrees and 90% humidity. And there are great mushrooms, but I just want to like fall down on the side of the trail and like melt. And so, you know, being out on a day where none of that is the case, like I brought lunch, I can sit outside, I might even go and stick my toes in the lake, who knows. But before I do any of that, I'm gonna finish up by talking about uh, our Cortinarius mushroom. So this is a Cortinarius violaceus, really beautiful species of purple mushroom. You have a couple of different mushrooms in the Cortinarius genus that are uh, purpley colored. And so, um, and these are not, you know, mushrooms that I, that I are like, that I eat. I guess some people do eat Cortinarius, but it is not a terribly common practice. Uh, and I'm not going to get into a lot of the reasons why. Also, Cortinarius as a genus is being completely exploded and split into, I don't even know how many different genera. And I emotionally am too fragile to even start going down that road. But more to the point, I am hopeful 
that, um, you know, I can gather information that I can sort of, I want someone to write a summary of what's happening. But until that happens, I'm going to call these Cortinarius type mushrooms. So, um, you know, we have a number of them that are purple, but uh, Cortinarius violaceus is very, very dark purple. And it also is almost sort of like got a brownish, uh, you know, dark brown to blackish uh, cap, um, like, or, you know, overlay on this dark, dark purple cap. And you can see also around the rim of the stem here, it's a little bit of a uh, sort of a rusty brown. And, uh, the thing that makes a court a court is, uh, it has rusty brown spores and a cortina. So essentially here, let me do this again. Stupid setup so so ridiculous I did a really bad job here uh so what you have is what's called a cortina so that is it's not a ring on the stem in the sense of it being uh like a very protective layer of tissue it's more webby and cobwebby and so it leaves a ring on the stem that is uh much l more ephemeral and webby instead of one of these rings that is like a protective layer of tissue Quartz also have uh, rusty brown spores. And so when you pick them, you oftentimes will see uh, a mushroom that has gills that are sort of a rusty brown color. This one, as you can tell, is sort of a more tan color. And so the, you know, the gills started out tan and you can see that rusty brown starting to come in. But in the case of our Quartinarius violaceus, let's see if I can also, I'm gonna use, here we go, use my basket, see if we can block some light. Oh, it's so bad. Uh, oh man, all right, this is getting ridiculous. But underneath you can see it's it's more of a, uh, uh, there we go, that doesn't help very much. Uh, more of a like dark, um, uh, rusty color starting to come in here on these very, very dark purple gills. And so quartz can be different colors, but that uh, cortina, uh, that, you know, cobwebby uh, veil that's on the stem and sometimes goes from like the stem to the cap. That's my favorite kind of quartz to find is you actually have like this little cobwebby thing, uh, you know, attached uh, between the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the stem and the margin of the cap. So that is pretty much everything I have the stamina to discuss. There are a few other things that I probably can't uh, illuminate enough for it to be worth your while. Thank you for spending some time with me. I hope you are doing very well. I hope you find lots of mushrooms and let's do this again soon.